You know, I want to thank you for, uh, for the way we treat one another. Seriously, a lot of the, a lot of the church gurus, so to speak, today, would like to say that's, uh, that's something we should forget about. What we just did. Because in, uh, in many congregations, it seems to be more of a hindrance than it is a help. But it occurs to me that it's all about the spirit within which it's done. <coughs> and it seems obvious to me that the spirit here makes it a really good thing. Because of, of you reaching out and allowing Christ's Spirit in you to make it what it is. And, and so I thank you for that. In that same spirit, I want to remind us all tomorrow evening we have a precious time, opportunity to celebrate, remember, and tribute to Wendy's life as she lived in here on earth and to uh, truly celebrate the life that she now enjoys in the glory of heaven. So tomorrow evening, um, at 6 o'clock, there will actually be an opportunity for some viewing, and at 7 o'clock is the memorial service itself, right here in the sanctuary. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come down to this moment in our worship today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us, and our lives would be changed. Christ's name. Amen. I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this message this morning. Uh, we're in an I am series. This morning we're gonna look at chapter 14 of the Gospel of John. So I really encourage you to pull out your scriptures and to look at that chapter. There's some Bibles under the chairs. If you brought your own, that's always a really good thing. You know, I always use the analogy. Every time I go to play racquetball, I play racquetball about twice a week. Every time I go to every time I go to play racquetball, I have my racket with me. <laughs> <laughs> so one way to come to worship, I'm just saying, you know, pull out your scriptures and turn to the 14th chapter of John. You have heard these words over and over again, but I'm betting that today God reveals them to us in a new way. Especially verse 6, because verse 6, 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 6, holds two of the most remarkable statements of Christ ever. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Those might be the two most exclusive statements that Jesus ever made. But I want us to remember, as always, while Jesus speaks an exclusive truth, he's always sharing that in an inclusive message, because that's who we are. So let's look at the very beginning, at verse 1, verse 11, and verse 27, the beginning, the middle, and the end, because what happens there is the main theme of this chapter gets repeated right there. Verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled, be worried, be anxious, be shaken, be in shame, have sorrow, be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So this idea about not being in trouble, not having hearts in trouble, and believing, those, that's the thing we're dealing with. Verse 11, believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Believe me. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Jesus is going this extra mile to reassure the disciples. Why? Because he knows the disciples are facing an unholy turmoil of soul. An unholy turmoil.
commonwealth of sorts. Now you might say, what in the world is that? An unholy turmoil of soul. An unholy turmoil of soul comes to souls like yours and mine who know sin. And therefore, they're troubled and they're in sorrow and they're in shame and they become afraid. He's speaking to that. Now, we need to make a distinction because the scriptures tell us that Jesus himself was troubled. Even in this, this chapter right before this, in this scenario that we have in chapter 14, all right, which is part of a, uh, a, a group from 13 to 17, these chapters, all about Jesus in the upper room. Chapter 13, 21 says, after saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. But here's the difference. Jesus has no <coughs> sin in his soul. Amen? Amen? So his turmoil is different than our turmoil. In chapter 14, Jesus isn't talking to his turmoil. He's talking to our turmoil, the troubled hearts of his disciples. Now, why are they troubled? Well, it has to do with the bigger picture of where they are in the upper room and what's happening. Remember, this is the night that Jesus gets arrested and is taken to the high priest, eventually taken to Pilate, and by tomorrow at noon, he will be crucified and dead. So, like, this is it. This is the very last hours on earth. And some things are happening that are troubling. He's, for example, he has taken off his clothes and he's washed all of their feet. That's pretty unnerving to them. You know, that's troubling to them. That's unsettling to them. He tells them that he is saying things to them that are going to happen. He's foretelling what's going to happen. That's kind of scary. That's a little spooky. And he says he's doing that so when they do happen, when these things he's telling them do happen, they will know that he is who he is. One of the things he tells them is that one of them is going to betray him. That really upsets them. I mean, that's, that's unnerving. He tells them that in a short while, he's going to be going away, and they can't come where he's going, and that's pretty disconcerting to them. He gives them a new command. After all this time, he gives them a new command. That's kind of puzzling to them. And then he looks at Peter, and he says, Peter, before the day breaks tomorrow, you're going to disown me three times. And that just breaks Peter's heart. I mean, does that make verse 1 in chapter 14 really clear? Let not your hearts be troubled. I mean, that's exactly where they are. I mean, if you were Peter, wouldn't your heart be troubled right now? I mean, my son would. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus reassures him. Don't be anxious. Don't be shaken. Let go of your sorrow. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Turn to me. Trust me. Hold on to my words because my words are God's words. I am one with the Father. <coughs> Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I mean, that echoes what we talked about two weeks ago, right? When Jesus was in the temple and he says, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Jesus is saying, look, believing in me is believing in God. Trust me so that your hearts will not be troubled and you won't be afraid. Hold on to these words and you won't be troubled. And then he backs that up 
by giving us some reasons why that's true. Look at verse 2. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now I really love that translation, dwelling places, as opposed to rooms, I mean. And we'll see why in a few minutes. Dwelling places for many. Not many dwelling places. Dwelling places for many. That's the concept. That Jesus is trying to get across here. So look at this. I, me, myself, in person, my own person is going, is going, is leaving, is departing. I am exiting here. I am going to prepare. I'm going to make arrangements. I'm going to get ready. I'm going to fix. A place, which means a dwelling for you. Everyone's invited, but there's a place for you. Your dwelling, a dwelling for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, I don't know how your mind works. But when I read that a long time ago, I was curious as to what that might mean in relationship to Jesus' words in Matthew 25, verse 34. When he's telling this parable, and he mentions in there, then the king will say to those in his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation from the beginning of the world. So I'm thinking, if I have a place that's been prepared from the foundation of the world, what is Jesus preparing? I mean, is there something wrong with my place? Does something need fixed? I mean, what's what's really going on here? And Here's the sense that I make out of this. I'm sharing it with you. Jesus is going to make it possible to enter my place. Because you see, at the time Jesus is speaking this, my place is inaccessible. My place is locked up tight, if you will. It's unavailable. Jesus is saying, unless I, myself, go now, you will not be able to enter in. Because at this moment, that place is closed up to sinners. You can't get in. Unless I go and do what I am about to do. Hmm? I am going to be the way you can enter your place. I have a lot of work to do in the next <laughs> few hours. I need to go in order to open the door to your place. And it's your place. I'm not going to any hotel. See, we each have our own place. It makes a difference, you know. I have a place in my father's house as a child because there aren't any guests in heaven. Amen. Believe me, Jesus says. Trust in me. Turn to me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Here's another reason why. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. That's verse 3. There's an amazing shift that happened right there. 
Did you catch it? I mean, if you, like I did for years and years and years, if you are thinking a place, like a room, and that's where it often gets translated, I go to prepare a room for you. Well, in our mind, in our thinking, we begin associating that with some kind of a place. I go to prepare a room for you. Notice how Jesus clarifies that and tells us what's really happening here. Jesus says, I will come and take you to myself. Wow. Do not mistake what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I myself will be your dwelling place. I am your room, so to speak. And I am going to prepare <coughs> to receive you to myself because I am not yet ready for you to do that. Your dwelling place is not ready yet. I have something I have to do first. And only I can do that for you. And I want you to know it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to be fun. But no one else can. Except me. What an insight. You see that? You see? You see what he's really saying? Don't think about dwelling in a room. Think about dwelling in a person. In Jesus. To be in heaven is to be with Jesus. And to be with Jesus is to be in heaven. That's way better than being in a room. Do not read this and think that Jesus is coming to take me to a room in heaven. It does not say that. Read it carefully. It says, Jesus is coming to take me to Himself. To be with Jesus is to be in the Father's house, to be in Him, to be in my place. It's not a literal room. And I realize that some here might be crushed, totally. You know, think about that, because one of your favorite songs is in my Father's house. You know, in a big, big house, lots and lots of rooms, and a big, big table with lots and lots of food, a big, big yard where we can play football. Yeah. Well, listen. Don't give up that feeling. Because that feeling is a great feeling. It's a real feeling. Just give up the image. Got it? Okay. Do not be in trouble, Jesus says. Believe in me. Trust me. Look to me. Turn to me. Here's another reason why. Verses 4 through 6. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <coughs> What we can really appreciate about Thomas is that he would dare to speak his heart. We see that happening several times. And in him speaking his heart, we can recognize the struggle, the troubled hearts that Jesus is speaking to here. Thomas is troubled. Lord, we have absolutely no idea where you were going, how could we possibly know the way? And of course, that's when Jesus gives his infamous answer, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And lots of times, we like to isolate that verse and just, just take it right there and sit on that verse and we, we, we just go to town. I mean, you can preach on that verse alone for three months, but 
I want you to recognize the context of sin because Jesus immediately, he doesn't even stop there. Jesus just keeps right on going. He says, if you know me, you will know my Father also. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him. And you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And we'll be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And you still do not know me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And if you do not, then believe me because of my works themselves. So once again, what we see here is a troubled heart. We see Philip's troubled heart. He asks with deepest sincerity, Jesus, we really want to see the Father. I mean, nothing would satisfy us more. Can you show us the Father? Now, to get to the emotion of that request, I want you to look at one word in particular that Philip uses here. It gets translated as enough or satisfied. You know, there's a couple other words in different translations, you know. That would satisfy us. That word is the same word Paul says that Jesus used when Jesus was speaking to Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient, same word, for you. For power is made perfect in my weakness. Remember, Paul was asking to have this, this thorn in his flesh taken away. And Jesus says, look, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. Sufficient and satisfied. That, that carries a message. The point of that word is that all that is needed, all that would be enough, is provided for. Sufficient and satisfied. God gives us what we need, what is enough. God gives us and satisfies us with what is sufficient. So now notice how this claim that Philip his claim to this answer, the, the, the question that Philip is asking, how it enters into our everyday life. You know, we often use these verses in John 14 to speak at funerals. It's a way of comforting troubled hearts who are dealing with death. And certainly there's a sense in this passage where it's talking about the end. Whether that means the end of the world or whether that means the end of our lives in this world, you know. We think about how Jesus comes and takes us to our dwelling place. And while that's nice, I mean, that's, a, that's a true thought, the problem is that's you can't just sit there alone because that's not where a lot of people are. That's, that's not where Philip was. That's, Philip wasn't interested in that. Many people aren't thinking about the end because they won't let themselves think about the end or, or maybe they can't think about the end because their everyday life that they're living right now is too overwhelming. I, mean, I can't think about the end because I have to worry about the stage three cancer I'm dealing with right now. I can't think about the end because 
Actually, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job and my house at the moment. I'm not worried about the end. I'm worried about my child because I don't know where he or she is and I don't know if he or she is okay. I'm not worried about the end until I figure out how in the world I'm going to get through this divorce. See, Philip says, I don't know what you mean about you are going away. I'm not sure what that means. But listen. Can you help me see God the Father? Because that's what I really want. In other words, Philip bears this pressing, immediate, everyday issue that he has in his life. It's troubling his heart. Bringing fear into his life. He says, that's what I'm really concerned about here. What about that? And Jesus addresses that in our lives. That's the good news about, about these verses in this chapter. In fact, Jesus repeats the answer to that six times in four verses. I already read it. Did you catch it? If you didn't, just go back and count them with me. John 14, 7, number one. If you know me, you will know my Father also. Number two, second part of verse seven. From now on, you do know him, meaning God, and you have seen him. Number three. Verse 9, first half. Jesus said to him, Have you been with me all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Second part of that verse. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Do you get it? Jesus is saying, look, Philip, it's never going to get any better and this, the Father is right here with you. I am the Father. I am the way. That is the truth. And Jesus ends the evening in the upper room by praying. Part of this prayer says, I have given them your, meaning God, your word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And this is eternal life. That they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Christ's truth sets us free from looking for God in the wrong places. Christ's truth sets us free from looking for God in the wrong places. I am God. See me, see God. Believe me. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Think of it this way. If my friends and relatives, me personally, were looking for me and they went to Tampa, what would that be about? I mean, I've told them all that I live in Jacksonville and I've given them my address. That's the truth about where and how to find me. To look anywhere else would be wasted time and energy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do you see?
see what happens here? God the Father came to us so that we might know how to come to the Father. You cannot come to the Father looking in your own way, in your own places. The Father has made a way to come to Him. That's when He came to us. And He gave instructions for coming to Him. That's the truth. Now without the Father, who is the Creator, there can't possibly be life. To look or believe you can find God wherever you choose to look, and to think that you can reach heaven however you can work it out, is wrong thinking. Believe me, know me, trust me, and you will know life. I give life. My words are life. Jesus says in John 6, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. John 10, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now Peter got that, that message. He preached to the religious leaders of Jerusalem after the resurrection and he said, this, Jesus, is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Meaning, by which we can have eternal life. That conviction is what started the church, friends. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Because I am the way and the truth and the life. Now Philip and Peter and Thomas might have thought, yeah, well that's all well and good, but you just said you're going away. So who cares if you're the way and the truth and the life? I mean, if you're going away, how's that going to help us? Because we're still here facing tough issues every day. That's a fair point. <clears throat> so Jesus makes one final argument for why we should not be troubled and we should believe in Him. 14, verses 16 through 18. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, because He abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. I'm coming to you. I'm sending the Spirit, but I'm coming to you. You see that? I'm sending you another helper to be with you now and forever. The Holy Spirit of truth. I will not leave you orphaned. Meaning, you will not be alone. The Spirit, my Spirit, will abide in you. So, Paul can write to the Romans truthfully, chapter 8, and said, But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. You see what Paul did there? He makes the Spirit and the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ all the same and one. <coughs> Jesus is saying, as He ascends into heaven, I am leaving earth but I am not leaving you, Matthew 28. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end. Yeah, Jesus is reassuring. I know you have a lot to deal with. 
but I'll help you. I'll be with you. That's the promise God made from the beginning. I am who I am is with you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And while that's a divine truth, Jesus being the way and the truth of the life, you know what? It's absolutely of no value to us unless Jesus becomes my way and my truth and my life. Amen. There's a difference between being the way and truth and life and being my way and truth and life. Unless I find God and salvation through Him, I will never really know the Father. And I will never really receive salvation. So that's the gospel call, friends. Yes, Christ is the way and the truth and the life. But is Christ our way and truth and life? What way, what truth, what life are we trusting in? Because it makes all the difference in the world with our troubled hearts. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for this message and this truth. Thank you for sending us the way and the truth and the life. Or help us each and all to stop looking our own way in our own 